Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope uh, you managed to get a break and get a, get a drink or something. Um, so the, the, the final the second session for this afternoon uh, will be presented by Sophie Valky from uh, Surfax. Uh, again, it's parallel programming in practice, but this time uh, looking at code coupling. So I shall hand over to Sophie. Okay, hi. Uh, so yes, I work at Surfax in Toulouse. Uh, I'm a research engineer and I work in uh, climate modeling and my main interest is uh, code coupling. Um, so I will present the second part of the talk and of the course. And as before, please feel free to ask questions through the chat and Chris will interrupt me as needed. So as we said uh, earlier, code coupling is one example of parallelism, of task parallelism, where each task, each code that we want to couple is itself parallel, as uh, Chris just uh, presented in details. So the objectives of this second part of the course is to, well, describe the concepts of code coupling. Uh, at the end of, the, of the, the course, you should be able to evaluate qualitatively the impact of different coupling configurations. And I will go in details on this, on how, how you implement the coupling will influence the performance of the coupled application in general. Then you should be able to classify the different implementation of coupling software that exist that are available given their main characteristics. And we will see that we have, we can uh, split the existing soft coupling software into two main uh, broad categories. And then you should be able to uh, describe the most uh, used coupling software in climate modeling in climate and weather applications, because, I mean, that's what I will present, of course. So this is the outline of my talk. I will just go over an introduction. Uh, describing the different constraints that one faces when he or she wants to couple different codes. And then I will go, uh, and then I will describe the two typical implementation of code coupling that is sequential versus concurrent coupling. I will uh, illustrate how those implementation influence the global performance of a coupled system. And then I will go over the different technical solution that you can uh, choose when uh, you want to implement a coupling that is exchange of data between different codes. Then I will describe in more detail a few coupling software that are currently used in climate modeling. And I will uh, conclude the presentation describing in more detail uh, the coupling algorithm that, in, that is the sequence of exchanges between a few uh, coupled general circulation models. And I will find, finish with a summary of, uh, of the presentation. So what does coupling of code mean? You have two main concepts in code coupling. The first one is that when you couple codes, you exchange information at the interface of those codes and you need to transform this information so that the data produced by one code is understandable by the other code. So that the first part of the coupling is to exchange and transform and transform the information at the interface of the code. But of course, to do that, you also have to synchronize the code and manage their execution. So those two uh, main functions are what um, coupling software uh, do. They exchange, transform the information, and they manage the execution and synchronize the code. Um, so why do we want to couple different codes? Of course, it's because we want to, global, to, uh, to model a system globally, taking into account the interaction between the different components. For example, if you want to to, to model a, an engine, for example, you want to do some coupling between fluid and structure codes because the, deform the deformation of the structure will have a direct impact on the fluid flow and vice versa. And uh, climate modeling or is, is a very good example of, uh, of component coupling because, um, of course, you want to couple 
you want to model the global system globally. You want to model each component, but also the interactions between the, the components, for example, the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. So that's really why you want to couple code to model a system globally and not only uh, component per, com per component. So what are the what are the constraints in code coupling? Of course, you would like uh, the coupling to be easy to implement and portable. You want the coupling to be flexible in the sense that you want to be able to easily change the components or the coupling fields or, for example, the coupling frequencies or maybe the transformation you perform in on the coupling on the coupling fields. Uh, a big constraint is that usually you start from existing and codes that are developed independently by developed code by uh, independent groups, and sometimes it's quite hard to impose coding uh, standards. So that's that's a very um, important constraint. And of course, you will run your um, your coupled application on some computing platform using some operating system and you have to take care about their characteristics and limits. And uh, uh, another very important uh, constraint in code coupling is that you want the global performance of the coupled system as a whole to be uh, to be acceptable. And when we talk about global performance of the coupled system, we have to define what we're talking about. We may be uh, talking about the load balancing of uh, the different components. That is, uh, when you have a load balance system, you have a system into which uh, all the computing resources that are available are really used all the time. It means that you don't have one component waiting for the other and leading and, and uh, wasting some resources. So that's something you know you want to to make sure to have a load balance system, not to waste any resources. But you may be uh, interested in uh, in having a good uh, simulation throughput. That is, how fast do you want? To that is, you want to get the results very fast, and this is really this is usually measured in climate in uh, what we call SYPD, simulated year per day. So, how many simulated years of climate do you do you achieve per real day? So, it may be that a system which is not perfectly load balanced uh, will um, will get a a better throughput. So sometimes you have to waste some resources to get your result your result faster. But then what you want to uh, optimize maybe not the simulation throughput but the CPU CPU cost. Maybe you have um, some uh, definite uh, computing resources available, and maybe you don't care too much about getting the results very fast. So what you want to optimize is really uh, how much uh, how much computing resources you use to get the results, and this is usually measured in uh, core hours per simulated year. That is how many cores you use for how many hours to simulate one year of your climate. So depending on what you uh, look at, you may be uh, you may uh, do different choices, different implementation choices whether you're more interested in getting a load balance system or having a very good throughput or minimizing the CPU cost. And usually it's impossible to define a layout in your coupled simulation that optimize at the same time the three criteria. But you have to be aware about those criteria and you have to be aware that when you make choices, you have to know what, what you do. So this was for the introduction. Now about the different uh, implementation of coupling. Um, by, uh, I mean, the, the Earth system, the nature of the Earth system is concurrent, right? In nature, the ocean and the atmosphere evolves conti continuously and they exchange fluxes of momentum, water and heat continuously. But uh, when we model the, the Earth system, 
we solve equations that are discretized in space and time. And in fact, you can implement different coupling algorithm and uh, you, pen, you can represent your system differently playing with the lags of the different coupling fields. And I will come back on this concept. And of course, the performance of the coupled system will be impacted by the implementation of your coupling algorithm. And the science and the physics you want to model will determine what is acceptable regarding you know, the, the, the physical point of view. Um, and as I said, you have a um, different way of implementing the coupling, and now I will uh, talk more in detail about this. So when you couple two codes or two components, you can have sequential coupling, uh, sequential components. Uh, sequential components are, are illustrated here on this graph. You see that the first component starts it, its time step and then produces a, a field that is needed for the second component to start its time step. And then at the end of uh, the, component, the second component time step, it delivers field F2 here, which is needed by the first component to go on with its time step. So basically, when you have a sequential component, uh, the, the, the first component cannot do anything while the second one is working, and vice versa. And this is, for example, the, um, uh, what happens when you do an implicit resolution of the heat diffusion equation from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the surface model, the land or the ice. So the, the first equation here is, the, is the, uh, the heat diffusion equation. And when you discretize it, you have different choices, as, uh, as Chris also presented. And you may want, and you may um, uh, decide to, to use an implicit resolution where, uh, where the temperature, for example, at, um, at uh, the, the, the next uh, time step, uh, depends on depends on the temperature at the next time step. So this is why we call this implicit. And when you solve this system, you end up with a with a classic uh, tri diagonal system. And you solve this by doing a classical um, uh, up uh, down and up uh, sweep. Um, I have a question. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let me just go back, go to the, to the chat. So, if I'm just going to repeat the question for the recording. So, the question is, how can one determine the number of cores needed for a particular simulation? Okay, so that's a very general question, and I guess that's the question that, I mean, I will not answer with a definite number. Uh, I'm just trying here to show you the different aspects that you have to take into account to determine the, uh, the optimal number, of course, for each uh, component. So let me just go over the presentation. And after this, you will not have one uh, precise answer to your question, but at least you will have um, you know the the, criteria, the the things you have to look at to define this this number of cores. Okay, so as I said, com a, se a component can be sequential, and that's what you you, you have when you do uh, the um, uh, when you do the implicit resolution of heat diffusion equation, because when you do this, the resolution of this. Tr tridiagonal tri system, basically you solve the system from the top of the atmosphere to the, to the interface, and then you go in the land uh, or the ice levels from the top of the land to the bottom of the ice, and then you go up again, and then you go back to the atmosphere levels. So basically when you solve this, when you, when you are in the, uh, in the atmospheric levels, the land is not doing anything and you cannot solve anything because you wait for the, uh, for the interface value and the same thing for the while the uh, the system is uh, being resolved in the in the land on the land levels so uh, so if you, when, but when you have a sequential component one important thing to do to to realize is that you can still force the parallelism of those of those components 
uh, by using the coupling fields produced at the previous time step, at the previous coupling time. So for example, here you have your first component, which is running, which produces F1 at T at the time step t minus 1, which is received by the second component, which can then start its coupling time step. And then the first component is waiting for F2. And usually in a, in a sequential algorithm, it will wait for, um, for the second component to produce F2, and it will go on with this. But if you use, if you decide to implement your coupling such that it's the field two produces at the time step before that is used at t minus one in component one, then component one will be uh, able to go on and to complete it, its time step with with the information of the previous time step from from the other component. And you see that if you do this, if you allow um, uh, component one to use the coupling fields produces, uh, produced by uh, component two at the previous uh, coupling time step, then you will be able to run your, um, your, your component uh, concurrently at the same time. So this is, but of course you cannot, I mean, this, if you, if you allow your component to use some information delivered at the previous coupling um, uh, time step, uh, you have to make sure that the physics you are uh, modeling or the, the science that you are doing allows this. I mean, that you're not doing anything really uh, foolish by doing this. But, you know, you have to remember this, that even if you have components that are naturally sequential, you can force them to run concurrently by playing on the lags of the different coupling fields. And similarly, if you have concurrent component, and this is typically the case when what we have when we do ocean atmosphere coupling, basically you have both components that run their time step at the same time, and then they produce their coupling field, so F1 for component one and F2 for component two. And then those fields are sent to the other component that uses them for this coupling uh, period. You see here that the, the components are running uh, concurrently at the same time in parallel. They exchange a coupling field at the end of the coupling period, and then they go on. But similarly, you could decide to run those components sequentially. For example, if you at, um, at uh, for the time step t of the component one, um, you use uh, the field that produces uh, produced by component two at time step t, but then for uh, for component two, uh, for the for, for the next time step of component two, you want to uh, use the coupling fields produces by the uh, component one at time t. So if you do this, you force um, you force F2 to wait for, for field F1 of, uh, at time T, and then you force the components to run one after the other. And while one is doing, the other is not, while one is running, the other is not doing anything, it's just waiting for the information. So if you implement that coupling algorithm, you can run sequentially components that you could also run concurrently. So these are choices that you have to make depending on the performance you want to get and depending on how you want to use your, your, your computing resources. So talking about the performance of uh, the, the coupled system, uh, let's suppose that you have sequential component and you want to run them sequentially. Of course, what you will, uh, how you you will implement uh, a real sequential coupling if you want to do this. Uh, it means that so here you have I have just a, a sketch, uh, and this is time going on from uh, top to bottom, and you have different uh, cores or processors or PEs uh, that. Those are this is the these are the computing resources which is available. So if you have sequential component and if you want to implement sequential coupling, what you will do is that you will run your components um, on um, on you will run you will run them one after the other on all the computing resources available. 
So component one will run using all the, the, the resources, then we'll produce F1, which, which will be used by component two, which will run also on all the computing resources and so on. And the simulation will, will, will go on with this with a sequential coupling, one, coup one component running using all resources and then the second, the other and, and back to the first one. And uh, so the advantages of this uh, configuration is that you see that your system will be autom automatically be uh, load balanced in the sense that all the resources will be used all the time by, by you know, that's by uh, intrinsically because, because you implement this all uh, like this. But it may be not optimal for the CPU cost because when you do this, you force both components to run on the same number of cores, on the same numbers of, of uh, processes. And that may be not optimal for, uh, and that number may not be optimal for both uh, components. Uh, Chris just showed that the, uh, I mean, the scaling uh, behavior of different codes will be different. And the optimal uh, scaling point will certainly not be the same for your two components. So when you, when you force your component on the same number of cores, you force, you, 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 you will not be able to run them at their optimal scaling point. Um, so that might be not optimal for the, C, for the, for the whole CPU cost. Uh, regarding the throughput, this will not be optimal either because you will use what you will lose one level of parallelism. Your components will not be running uh, at the same time, and uh, so the only parallelism you will you can exploit is the com the parallelism of the components themselves. Um, also, when you run those your 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 components on the same. Uh, a set of computing resources. Usually, what you do is that you 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 merge them into one uh, one same code, and then you have just subroutine called one after the other within that code, and that might be quite delicate because when you merge a different component into one code, you can have different conflicts regarding, for example, the IOs or the internal communication of the components or the units, etc. So that's something that you have to, to, to be uh, to, to, to take care of. Uh, one advantage, but, but one advantage of this uh, configuration is that theoretically, as you are running on the same course, you are sharing the memory between those components and you could exchange the coupling fields through the memory of, uh, of your components. They are sharing the memory. They they are running in one same code. They are running on the same cores, so um, they, they they could in principle exchange um, the well get access to the coupling uh, fields in in the memory and not duplicate uh, the memory for the coupling fields. One um, disadvantage of this configuration is that you have no flexibility in the coupling algorithm. It's really running one, producing the coupling fields, running the other, and producing the coupling fields again. You have no flexibility in that. So that's for sequential coupling. So you will you see that you have advantages and disadvantages, and it really depends on you know what you're modeling and if you will choose this or, or not. So regarding concurrent components, so concurrent coupling. So I recall that the components are running at the same time, and then they exchange coupling fields, and then they go on for the next uh, coupling period. Uh, you will, uh, if you have this type, if you want to implement this type of coupling, you will necessarily implement, uh, you will necessarily run uh, your different components on separate sets of uh, computing resources. So this is illustrated here. Again, time is going from up uh, to down. And you see here that in this illustration, you have three cores or three processors or three PEs that are used for component one and two cores used for component two. And they can exchange uh, coupling fields while they're running. So uh, an advantage of this configuration is that it's good for throughput because you've activated uh, the component level of parallelism, that is they're running at the same time. Um, it's uh, it's probably uh, harder to load balance 
this type of a configuration because you have to find uh, the number of, of cores on which to run each component so that they run at the same speed. You don't want one component to be uh, finished and waiting for the other. So you have to make different tests and you have to uh, find the, the, the number of cores which will make uh, the, two co the two components run at the same time in order not to waste resources. And it might be, again, that if you have a load balance configuration, each component will not run at its optimal scaling point. So it might be that you will have a load balance system, but that the CPU cost will not be optimal. So it's always a delicate question on what you really want to optimize. Um, one advantage of this uh, type of concurrent coupling is that you can run your different components into uh, different executables, so they will keep their own um, uh, I mean, they, they will keep their, their, their own, they will be run as when they were running standalone, and there will be no conflicts uh, regarding I.O. units or internal communication. Another advantage of this of this con of concurrent coupling is that you can you can implement a more flexible coupling algorithm because the compo the components are both running all the time so you can decide at any point of time i mean if the data is available of course to uh, to to send some data uh, back and forth so the coupling algorithm that you can exchange are much more um, uh, diverse than when you than when you have sequential coupling the drawback is that the, the coupling exchanges will be less efficient because the the coupling ex the coupling fields will you will not be able to exchange uh, the coupling fields through the memory. The memory is not shared. You have different executables that may run on different nodes, and you will have to use uh, some uh, some protocol to exchange the data, like message passing or other protocol. So that might be. Uh, that might be a drawback. I mean, if the if the coupling is very very tight, uh, and if you have a lot of data to exchange, uh, you may not want to implement concurrent coupling because of the duplication of the coupling fields in each uh, component. So, I hope this gives you, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, let's say, a very basic um, view of uh, the different way of, uh, of coupling uh, and the advantages and disadvantages of each, um, of each configuration. And the choice you will make uh, depends on the performance you want to get, the science you, you model, uh, the scaling uh, curves of your different components. So it's a very a delicate issue to, uh, to, 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 um, to run the different components within a coupled system. So now regarding the different technical solution to coupling that we have. I will here describe, let's say, four uh, different uh, technical solution. The, the first two solution are things that you can do, but you have to do this by yourself. And the last two, um, uh, the last two solutions are um, solutions using uh, available coupling software. So the first thing you can do if you want to couple your code is that you can just decide to change one of your original components that was running standalone. You turn this into a subroutine and you implement some uh, arguments to receive the coupling fields and some arguments to um, to, to, to make uh, the coupling fields available. And you have the first component to call the second co component as a subroutine. So that's a very, let's say, direct way of doing uh, coupling. You merge the code, and that's how the the coupling is. Um, that's how the coupling is implemented at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast uh, between the uh, IFS, the Atmosphere Model, and, and NEMO. NEMO is the ocean model, and within their system, it's just it's called as a subroutine of the atmosphere. 
I have a question. If both of the two are sequential code, is it good practice to parallelize each of them before coupling? Um, well, it will depend on the uh, the cost of each model. Um, uh, uh, for example, in our system, we often have a uh, river routing uh, component, which is very, which is not costly at all. And in many cases, we we run uh, these components into only one sequential component, and it's uh, and it's just running uh, concurrently with the other ocean and atmosphere big models, which themselves are, of course, parallel. And it does not slow, uh, it does not slow down the whole coupled system. So I would say, in general, it's better to parallelize your code, because in general, parallel code will run faster. But if you have components that are really not costly, it may be that running them on one process will not slow down the whole thing. So it really depends. Um, um, it really depends on, on the on the relative cost of each code. So uh, I hope this answers the question. Now, if I go back to the uh, to the technical solution, so the first one is just merging the codes, having one uh, component calling you as a subroutine. That's how code coupling is implemented. That ECMWF. Uh, the advantage is, is that it's quite efficient because, uh, as I said before, the the, the coupling change. The co I mean, as you are merging two components to, into one code, which run on the same process, and same nodes, you can exchange a coupling field through the memory. Uh, you end up with having only one executable, and it may be easier to debug. Uh, one executable, then two executable running concurrently. The big drawback of this approach is that it's not easy to implement with existing codes. You have to uh, usually split your code into initialize, run, and finalize methods to do you know, both the initialization of your two components at the beginning and then the run part and so on. Um, so it may be, uh, it's not that easy to implement with existing code and it, there may be, uh, I mean, if you want, if you are using a code developed by, by another group and if the code evolves, then you might have problem phasing your, uh, your code with a different evolution on the developer side. Uh, as for the sequential coupling, uh, I mean, this is typically sequential coupling, right? This is not really flexible. The coupling algorithm is hard coded in your code. You put some data in, you get some data out, and you hard code this. And of course, as you are not using any generic tool or generic coupling software, you have no generic transformation or interpolation at hand. But still, it is used, and it quite be, it, it could be quite performant. The uh, second solution that you also have to do it, let's say, by yourself, is just to use an existing communication protocol. So you have your two components, you keep them uh, separate executable, and you just implement some, um, some instruction to send some data to the other program uh, and in the other program to receive the data from the first, from the first component. Uh, what you can uh, do to, um, to, to implement those exchange, you can use message passing. So this will be an MPI send, MPI receive. But you can also, I mean, we have done, um, it's not, um, uh, it's not really used today, but we've used PVM, which is another protocol, parallel virtual machine, and this PVM was used to do some heterogeneous coupling, which means that you have your two components running separately, a separate executable, but even on different machines, and you exchange the data through the uh, through the network. 
you have other also uh, techniques like TCPIP, SVIPC, or CORBA, and you can even use um, file on disk. So there, there are a couple systems today that work like that, and that's how they, they were doing coupling at the beginning. Uh, basically, the first program here just writes some data on the disk, and then the second program will just read this. Of course, this needs a mechanism of uh, synchronization. So an advantage of this is that you keep your program separate, so it's quite okay with existing code. But I mean, the drawback is that it's not easy to implement. You need to be an expert in the protocol you use. It's not flexible because you really have to hard code your coupling exchanges and the with which you couple. Of course, you're not using any generic uh, any coupling software, so you have no generic transformation interpolation at hand, and as you are uh, using some uh, something like MPI, you are the exchanges are less efficient than when you you do the, through the memory, and uh, and you duplicate your coupling fields. So these were the first two technical solutions uh, that you do, let's say, by yourself. Now let's have a look at, uh, at the, the two other technical solutions are uh, what I call the integrated coupling framework approach and then the, the next one will be the, the coupling library or coupler approach. And these are the two technical solutions that you can choose using uh, coupling software that is being developed for this. Um, so, uh, in, the, in the first approach, which is the integrated coupling framework approach, uh, what you do basically is that you take your original program, your er original component, you split them into elementary units, you adapt the... Um, the of echo is coming in sound, what does that mean? You, the sound's breaking up quite a lot, Sophie. Uh, not, not, sure, not sure what I can do about, about this. Do you still, you still hear me or, or is it? Sound is not good, sound, good. sound is not good. Well, well, maybe, 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 I don't know. Does it, does it make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, Start and stop your microphone, maybe, I don't know. Or I, or I can come And, and um, um, is it better, is it now? better now? I have to talk to Jess. Yes. No, I'm afraid it's still, it's still really bad. It's like, uh, I don't know. It might be worth just, just dropping out and uh, coming back in again. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, so okay, I'll just so come I'll back. Just Sorry about that. Okay, so um, Sophie's just going to drop her connection and come back in again. So if we just wait a moment, uh, hopefully the sound quality will then improve on the line. I just don't know how to... I just don't know how to 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 go out, and I is is and everyone else is, is everyone else on mute? Okay, we'll just wait for Sophie to rejoin and hopefully that will improve the sound quality.
Okay, I'm back. Do you hear me? Yeah, that's perfect. You hear me better? Okay, yeah, great. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, am I sharing my screen or how? The, yeah, I guess I have to do this again, right? No, it's, it's still being shared because you've uploaded. Yeah, but I can't. I don't have the. I don't have the the oh, bottom okay. bar to to. Okay. If you yes, yeah, so if you go to share again, then 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 you should have control. Doesn't work. Not sure why. When I click on share, nothing happens. Am I still a presenter? No. Uh, I'm not presenter anymore. So I guess that's why I can't. Chris, can you? Um... Okay, I've stopped. Share, I've stopped the sharing. So if you you should be able to start the sharing now. No. No, nothing happens when I click on on share my content. I'm not in the yeah. I'm not in the list of moderators. Yeah, I agree. I guess someone has to give me the rights to do that. Is uh, Julian or Luciana there? Or maybe Chris, what you can do is you 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 share it because it's in the files, right? And uh, I just tell you next slide. Ah. Okay, I've just made you a moderator. Guess, yeah, so I you see should be that. Able to share I now. see the yeah. Apologies okay, for everyone for this. We'll just bear with us a couple of minutes. We'll get it stored. Okay, do you see it? Yep, we have it. Yep. yep. Got it. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay, good. Sorry about that. The everyone. sound is okay. okay. Carry on then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I was uh, talking about uh, the first uh, technical solution using existing coupling software. And that's what I call the integrated coupling software. And that's what is used in many coupling software in the States, ESMF or FMS at GFDL, CPL7 at NCAR. And the idea in this approach is that you take your original program and you split them into elementary units and then you adapt them you adapt uh, your elementary units to the to the to the coupling software calling interface and to the standard data structure of that software and then you use the software to rebuild a new code a new hierarchical code into which you can call the units your elementary units either concurrently or one after the other and and you decide how you build you to build your to rebuild your new code um so the the uh, the the advantages of this approach is that it's quite efficient because when you rebuild your new code you can really decide how to run each unit uh in well you, you know you can you can implement any coupling algorithm you want uh whether it's sequential or concurrent of course, you have all the utilities that come with the software regarding the internal parallelization of the units, the regridding, the time management. So usually, um, it's a very complete set of software that uh, takes care for you, not only of the coupling between the units, but also about all the te technical stuff in your units. The drawback with this approach is that it's not that easy to implement with existing codes because you have to split your your original code into into different units and to 
rebuild the new code. So again, you may have problems synchronizing with the different uh, version of the code if your if your original codes were developed independently. So basically, this uh, this way of doing, which is used uh, again by many coupling software in the states, it's probably the best solution to implement your coupling if you have a controlled development environment into which you can impose some coding standards. And uh, if this is the case, then that's probably a very good way to do coupling. You, um, you, you, you each each group adapts uh, its uh, component, its units to the standards, and then all the groups can uh, share the, those different uh, components. But if you're not running, if you're not uh, working in that type of control development environment, then you may want to uh, to use the the coupler or the coupling library approach, and this is what we do um, in Europe. And I guess it's because we don't have this, you know, we we don't have like a top-down authority that will tell us what what to use. So basically this is the approach that is used in OASIS, in the OASIS coupler that I will present um, after, in the MCT library you, uh, developed by the Argonne National Lab, in YAC which is a coupler developed in the uh, in Germany and in the C coupler which is a, new, um, uh, a newer coupler let's say developed in China. And in this approach, it's really, let's say, the opposite philosophy than the previous one. You keep your program almost, well, as untouched as possible. And the only thing you have to do is to implement some, uh, some routine to send some data or to receive some data. And, but in, the, in those calls, you don't, uh, you don't, for example, for a sending instruction, you don't specify the target of your uh, of your send, and in the receive instruction, you don't specify the source of um, of your of your receive instruction. This is um, the the source or the target of the uh, of the coupling exchanges that is the matching between the send and the receive will be configured externally by uh, the user in an external configuration file, and the coupler or the coupling library we will just uh, at runtime uh, perform the coupling exchanges according to the, co the external configuration file. So the main advantage of this uh, approach is that it's pretty good with existing code because you don't change or you change them as little as possible. Of course, you can use all the generic transformation and regreening co coming with the coupling software, the coupling library. And uh, yeah, you can implement, uh, it's very good for concurrent coupling. It's, it may be less efficient than the previous approach because you can do only concurrent coupling and you have to uh, exchange your coupling fields through message passing and you have to, to, um, to, to, to I mean, the coupling fields will be duplicated in each, in each, uh, in each code. Um, another drawback is that as you keep the program uh, on touch and you run them as separate executable, it's, uh, it's good to avoid uh, so the conflicts that you would have if you would merge the code, but it may be uh, harder to, to debug because different things are running at the same time and when there's a problem, it's sometimes harder to see where the, pro the, the problem comes from. So basically this solution is probably, is, that's the one that we uh, mainly adopted in Europe, it's probably the best solution to couple independently developed codes when you can't or you don't have any top-down, uh, any higher authority that will, you know, impose a standard to use. So, different technical solution that depends on what you're ready to do with your codes. And uh, now, how am I doing with time? 45 minutes? Yeah, okay, so I'm doing good. So now I will go over a uh, few existing coupling software that are used in climate modeling and this will give you an illustration of those two categories of coupling software. So either the integrated coupling, um, integrated coupling framework or the re approach. Wow, that does not come out very well, but anyway, this is a, a historical, historical view. 
view of the coupling software uh, that are developed that were developed so you see that uh, we started in the 1990s with oasis in europe and you have the series of uh, oasis 1 oasis 2 uh, and the last version is oasis transct uh, just a few years later, the NCAR started developing the CPL coupler, uh, CPL3, CPL4, CPL6, and C uh, up to CPL6. So those, the, the, in this first square box here, you have all those, all those coupling frameworks have adopted the, uh, the external coupling or coupling library approach. You have also the data broker, um, um, coupling library. I'm just taking my notes here. Um, that's uh, been used. Um, that's been developed at UCL in the in the states, and um, and that and uh, and about at the same time the first integrated coupling uh, software was uh, being developed at GFDL with FMS um, and then ESMF followed uh, and then we had MCT which is a let's say lower level coupling library in the states uh, in 2010 that's when the development of the C coupler started in China and then uh, YAC which stands for yet another coupler in Germany and uh, more recently, we have the development of the Moab uh, Tempest Remap, which is being currently developed to replace MCT in the uh, Energy Exascale Earth System model, which is a state-of-the-art Earth System model uh, project funded by the DOE in the US. Uh, and you see that at NCAR, they switched uh, from CPL6 to CPL7, they, they've switched from the coupling library approach to the integrated coupling framework approach. Uh, and now I will describe in more details uh, ESMF, uh, FMF, FMS, CPL7, and the OASIS coupler. So to give you, let's say, because those are, let's say, the most widely used coupler or coupling framework. Um, used in climate modeling. So regarding ESMF, ESMF stands for the Earth System Modeling Framework. Uh, it's an open source software uh, for coupling uh, different components to form weather and climate application and earth science application in general. The idea was really to um, I mean, this was quite of a, let's say, a top-down approach. I mean, the different groups got together and said, okay, what should we do to facilitate the exchange of components between U.S. groups? And they got together and then they developed ESMF. And the idea is really that, uh, not to impose, but to, um, to, uh, to encourage different groups to use this uh, standard uh, uh, coupling software so that uh, if you have many components that uses uh, the software, then you are able to easily uh, build coupled applications based on those components. So it's funded by a different uh, US agency, uh, NASA, Department of Defense, NFS, NOAA, and we, you have also other uh, partners like the US the Air Force Weather Agency, Argonne National Lab, and so on. It has a very uh, free and very good uh, user support. So if you use the, the, the software and if you have problems, you can ask questions and you have people answering your questions. And that's a very important aspect when you start using a software. Um, it's written in C++ and it has a Fortran IT interface and partial interface to C, C++ in Python. And they have very good uh, software development practice. They have um, each, each night they have automatic, automatic testing of uh, the software over, over many different platforms. Uh, I will present a little bit more uh, the new OPSI layer, layer on top of ESMF, 
But just to say that today, ESMF and UOPC are used in major coupled systems at NASA, US Navy, NCAR, and NOAA. And so it's really an approach that is getting uh, more and more popular in the States. And it's really working quite well, I would say. Today, you have more than 30 uh, com uh, ESMF new OPSI comp compliant models. So you have different types of components, atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land ice, hydrology, land surface, chemistry, ionosphere, and wave components. So how does it work? I mean, ESMF is, 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 is a software of the integrated coupling software. So it's really a design which is based on the component concept. A component is a part of the code which has a very specific function and a well-defined interface. And in ESMF, you have two types of component. You have gridded components, which is a part of the code which models a physical domain or realizes a computational function. And you have coupler components, which transfer transform and transfer the physical fields between the gridded components. So the idea here with the SMF is really that the scientists should code only um, uh, the, the, the science part uh, of what he wants to model. And it should be the, the, the software it, he uses, he or she uses, that takes care about the, um, the coupling between the components and even you know all the the technical aspects of the components so to do this of course when the scientist codes a gridded component he has to adopt the ESMF standard calling interface and EF standard data structure and you have here an illustration of an ESMF application which is GEOS 5 and um, uh, you see here that GEOS 5 is really, I mean, they, they, they splitted their original code into uh, different, uh, let's say, more elementary uh, components. And then they used the SMF software to rebuild a new hierarchical code into which some components are run uh, in parallel. For example, the dynamics of the atmosphere is run in parallel with the physics with all those sub components but then uh, they are run uh, see, the, all this is run concurrently with the uh, for example the land ice or the ocean model so that's the general concept of ESMF to rebuild a new code based on your components um, when you um, so the user code the the, the code that is uh, uh, coded by the user really sits between the superstructure the superstructure is what couples the components and the infrastructure, which ensures an efficient parallel execution on different computing architecture. So, for example, the ESMF infrastructure will take care of, of course, I mean, you have to use the, the ESMF uh, routines to do that, but it can do the internal parallelization, the time and the management of the calendar, the error and handling, the I.O. and the regridding uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the coupling fields. So this is just an example of uh, some coding with the SMF. For example, here um, in the end, you will have an ocean atmosphere uh, couple code. So you have to uh, to take your original ocean model and you have to extract the running part of this uh, of the ocean. You have to uh, to uh, transform this into an, an ESMF uh, subroutine, which, uh, for example, has as input argument uh, some import state, which is of type ESMF state. So th this is very specific to ESMF, right? And this contains the coupling fields that will be that will be going into the ocean running part, and then you have an export state, which is the uh, which contains the coupling fields produced by the ocean. Um, uh, by the ocean running part. So once you've split all your original code into these uh, uh, 30 minutes left, yeah, that's good. Um, then, then you have to uh, code some uh, coupler components. So here you have, for example, a subroutine which will couple the ocean to the atmosphere, and it uses some um, 
ESMF routine, the, re, the ESMF field redist, which will redistribute the ocean field from the ocean to the atmosphere. And once you have all you all these uh, all these components, you 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 write a driver code that um, that registers all those different parts and that calls all those different parts. Uh, either sequentially or uh, or concurrently. For example, here in your driver code, you will you you will use ESMF grid comp run to run your ocean. You will use ESMF CPL comp run to run your ocean to atmosphere uh, CPL um, uh, subroutine and so on. So you really uh, adapt. You 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 take your code. You split it into elementary units. You adapt the interface and the data structure, and you use ESMF to to re uh, code to 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 recreate a new code uh, a new hierarchical code into which you can call your component either sequentially or or concurrently now um, a thing esmf data structure and component wrappers uh, of course does not the interoperability between the components. You have to make sure that the coupling fields produced by one component is usable by is is what the other component um, expects, and so on. And so, in 2007, a consortium of uh, NOAA, U.S. Navy, and uh, U.S. Air Force operational weather centers they they got together and this decided to develop uh, a layer on top of ESMF, which is called UOPSI. And so new OPC is a set of a convection of convention and higher level templates so to increase the interoperability of ESMF. And uh, in this uh, layer you have uh, uh, connectors which are a standard way of establishing combination between the components and uh, mediators that are wrapping co uh, uh, components and you have in particular you have special or specialized drivers. Uh, which um, implements some specific uh, algorithm between some specific uh, uh, components. And if you use those uh, those standard drivers, then you are uh, uh, you can make sure that you will be uh, able to, uh, to 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 build a new a new model and have your component interacting. So you have. Uh, just an example of three different uh, drivers. The first one on on the left is a very simple one where you have only an ocean and atmosphere uh, model. You may have um, a more complex uh, system. For example, you have here in B an um, an uh, ocean. Uh, Ocean, uh, atmosphere, ice, and wave model, and you see that the the model, the ocean, and the wave are interacting directly. But there's a mediator between the atmosphere and the ocean, and you may have here even a, a more complex one into which you have um, you can use this uh, this uh, this template to run ensemble uh, simulation, and the mediator here will. Um, will define will uh, let's say switch the atmosphere model used so uh, with the new opc layer some uh, standard templates were designed and it's um, which um, make sure that the uh, esmf which increases the interoperability of esmf because we they've agreed on the components and on on the the coupling field to exchange Okay, so that's it for ESMF. Now, um, a few words about CPL7, which is used, which is developed by NCAR. So um, this is, I mean, in CPL7 you have a predefined top-level driver. So it's not like with ESMF where you build your own driver. CPL7 has a predefined top-level drivers, and it uh, couples uh, and it can uh, assemble very flexibly different. Uh, ocean, atmosphere, land, and sea ice model into one executable. So it's been developed at NCAR. Uh, it's um, so as I said with CPL7, they went from the uh, the coupler uh, or coupling library approach to the integrated coupling framework approach uh, because they evaluate that this the integrated coupling framework is easier to debug and the time flow is easier to understand. 
Uh, so anyway, it's been uh, ported to different platforms and the performance has been evaluated. And here you have the illustration of the sequencing of action by the driving layer. So the driver manages the time and at each coupling uh, period it will start the ocean on a specific set of uh, computing resources and then it will prepare what is needed uh, for the land model to run, for the ice model to run. It will start uh, the, um, the land and the ice uh, on a specific set of uh, component on uh, processors and then it will get uh, the data back from uh, these three components and then it will run the, uh, the atmosphere. So the so what is really nice about CPL7 is that oh wow, this is not this those slides do not come out very well but anyway you have the idea here you have uh, here it's an illustration of uh, three different uh, different layouts that can be implemented with the driver with CPL7 driver and uh, you don't have to change anything in the code itself uh, the, the the layout so how you run your different components uh, is it's, it's specified externally in an XML file by the user so, for example, here on the, on the left, you have a layout where each component, that is the coupler, the land, the ice, the atmosphere, and the ocean, they are all run sequentially one after the other on the, on the, on the computing resources that are available. Uh, so time is going uh, from uh, top to, to, to bottom and on the, um, the x-axis is the, the represent the, the sets of, uh, of computing resources available. So in this first comp component you have a perfectly sequential coupling and maybe you don't see that but this takes uh, 22.3 seconds I think. This, those numbers are just illustrations, right? But with the same coupler, with the same uh, with CPL7 driver, you can decide to run your ocean concurrently, uh, so at the same time than the other components which are themselves running uh, sequentially. And you will see here that if you decide to do this, you will have, I mean, the, the system is not perfectly load balanced because you have here the, uh, the ocean processes that are not used for, I think it's 1.9 seconds. So, and the, the, the total time is uh, something like 22.6, so it's a bit, it's going a bit faster than the sequential layout, but it's wasting some resources. And you may have here, uh, you have here another uh, layout into which the ocean is again going concurrently on a different sets of cores. And you, uh, in this layout, you have the ice and the land also going concurrently, but then sequentially with respect to the atmosphere. And by choosing uh, uh, the, the, the number of uh, resources you uh, you uh, you allow you uh, allow to each uh, component, then you can get to this configuration where the total runtime is something like 19 seconds. So, of course, so 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 basically, the, the bottom line is that CPL7 allows you to um, to run different layouts without changing anything in your code. It's specified externally, and you will uh, choose one layout or the other depending on the, the, the components you, you, you are running, their resolution, uh, their scaling curve, and, uh, and of course the characteristics of your platforms. So this is a very nice and flexible uh, integrated coupling framework. Uh, its performance has been evaluated, but I will not go over this. Um, and then now just uh, the, the, the third integrated coupling framework I want uh, to, to present is FMS, which is developed in by GFDL. It's been active for more than two decades at GFDL. It's used in the last uh, international couple model inter intercomparison exercise with uh, GFDL CM4 and GFDL ESM4. It's been shown to be scalable for up to uh, 10,000 uh, uh, processes. And uh, FMS is a bit the, the, the predecessor of ESMF. So it's, uh, I mean, the basic were really um, 
uh, let's say, in, created by FMS. So it has a superstructure to to uh, manage the coupling between uh, the components and, in a, and an infrastructure which uh, takes care of, uh, for example, the internal polarization, uh, the diagnostics, and, and so on. So, um, what is very specific about FMS and uh, what I want to, to, to spend a little time on is the exchange grid. Um, the exchange grid is um, um, so you have here an illustration in, in yellow of an exchange grid and this is the exchange grid between the atmospheric grid in, in dark blue at the top and the land or the ice grid at the bottom. You see that these two grids are different and the exchange grid is given, is defined by the intersection of, uh, of the, two, uh, the two grids. So you see, for ex you see that each cell of the exchange grid is associated to one and only one uh, cell of each other uh, component. So for example here you have this cell which matches this one and this one and you have this one which matches this one and this one and so on. So that means that each um, each cell of the uh, exchange grid can be uh, can get values from uh, from uh, from specific cell of the of the of the two different grids. Um, so when coupling fields are transformed from one component to the other, they are first expressed on the exchange grid and then they are uh, aggregated on the target grid. And basically what is really nice about FMS is that you can do this implicit calculation of the of the turbulent fluxes of heat, humidity, and momentum across all the atmospheric land, uh, all the atmospheric and land or ice levels. This implicit uh, the, uh, calculation that I, I discussed uh, previously, and you can do this even going through uh, two different grids, going through the exchange grid. So when you do your the resolution of your tridiagonal system, you end up with a profile of temperature on each uh, each atmospheric and each uh, land level, and then you can calculate the turbulent flux on the exchange grid using the exact value of the atmospheric temperature which corresponds to the cell and the exact temperature of the land uh, cell corresponding to the, to, to the cell. And this means that basically you will calculate your turbulent flux without uh, regridding or without averaging any of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the surface variable. And this is really good because we, we know that the fluxes are not linear with respect to the, to the, to the temperature. So you should not regrid any temperature before doing the flux calculation. So I have about 15 minutes left. So let's go briefly about uh, over Oasis. So Oasis is the so Oasis is the let's say the only uh, example I will show about the coupler approach, uh, coupler or coupling library approach. OASIS is developed at Surfax since uh, 1991. We had the series of OASIS 1, OASIS 2, OASIS 3, which was a parallel coupler. And now we have OASIS 3 MCT, which is, uh, sorry, OASIS 1, 2, and 3 were sequential coupler. I mean, they were uh, monoprocess couplers. And now with MCT, we have OASIS 3 MCT, which is a parallel coupler. So basically, uh, we did a survey last year and we see that OASIS 3 MCT used by uh, 60, at least 67 modeling groups around the world to assemble, uh, okay, thanks Chris for 15 minutes, to assemble more than 80 coupled application. It's used in five of the seven European ESM in uh, CMIP6. So uh, this, is, this is a typical example of the coupling library approach. Basically, you don't change your code or you change it as little as possible. The only thing, let's say, what you have to do is to implement those calls. So you have different 
initialization calls, for example, to define the partition or to define the grid. And then what is more, uh, let's say, interesting is that you have those uh, puts and get, always this put and always this get that you implement in your uh, in the time step loop of your couple model of your model, sorry, and you have to see here that when you when when a component uh, puts some coupling fields, it does not know where it will go to, or when it gets or receives some coupling fields, it does not know where it gets it from. It's not specified in the code, but it's configured externally, and it's really the Oasis library that will perform the match between a put and the get according to what is specified by the user in an external configuration file. So this is much more flex flexible because when you have, uh, when you want to couple your component to another, to, to, to a new component, of course adapted to ways, you don't have to change anything in your code, you just adapt the external configuration file. So I will skip about the communication. Uh, so this is just an illustration of the different types of regridding that you have in Oasis, but you have this in almost uh, all standard couplers. You have, for example, a nearest neighbor interpolation where for each target point you take the nearest value on the source grid. You can have bilinear interpolation where you use uh, the four enclosing uh, neighbors. You can have a bicubic or higher level uh, interpolation where you use more points or use the points and their gradient. You can have conservative remapping where uh, the, um, the, the value of one uh, cell is given by the percentage of the area intersected by this, by this cell. So these are typical uh, regridding schemes that are available in ways MCT and also in other couplers. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, I have, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes for the coupling algorithm. So now what I want to show you is how the um, how the, the coupling is really implemented in um, in uh, different uh, coupled general circulation models, and you will see that this can be uh, very different from from one to the other. This is the coupling algorithm implemented in, let's say, most European coupling uh, coupled general circulation model. This is implemented in the French CNRM CM6, IPSL, IPSL CM6. This is in implement, which are developed in France. Uh, this is implemented in EC Earth, which is the uh, the coupled general circulation model de developed by a consortium of uh, European country. Uh, is the algorithm implemented in MPIESM, developed in Germany, and in HADGEM, developed at the UK Met Office. So this is the uh, the asynchronous coupling I already presented. The you have at the top, you have uh, this orange line represents the um, the uh, the running of the atmosphere of different coupling uh, period of the atmosphere and at the bottom you have uh, an ocean containing an ice model running so basically the both model they run uh, a coupling period and then um, and then at the end of each coupling period, the ocean ice model sends surface variable to the atmosphere. So for example, temperature or albedo or the current velocities or the ice fraction. And the, you, the, the atmosphere receive this and will use this information to run the next coupling period. And um, in return, the atmosphere and land model we will send uh, some fluxes to the uh, to the ocean so uh, fluxes of uh, momentum energy and water uh, so for example these uh, fluxes uh, they include uh, the stress over the ocean they include the latent heat and the sensible heat and the long wave uh, also the short wave flux and uh, also all the water fluxes, the evaporation, sublimation, uh, rain, and snow. And they also include the runoff uh, and the calving, the calving which is the breaking of ice from glacier to the ocean. 
So we see here that the, the ocean sends some uh, surface variable, the flux, so the, those surface variables are recreated from the ocean to the atmosphere, and the fluxes are calculated in the atmosphere. And this is not really, let's say, physically, because uh, usually the atmosphere has a lower resolution than the ocean. So basically, when you regrid the, uh, the, the surface uh, variable, uh, I mean, this is not really physically justified to calculate the fluxes because we know that the fluxes are not linear with respect to the uh, to the surface variables. So basically, the in principle, the fluxes should always be calculated in the model which has the higher resolution or on an exchange grid like in EFMS. But anyway, that's you know how it's been it's it's implemented in those models for let's say. Uh, historical reason and because we start with existing um, models that, um, that 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 do this that are forced by uh, variables and that calculated fluxes in the atmosphere uh, this is a little bit more complex coupling algorithm this is implemented in the um, European Center medium medium range weather forecast ECMWS you have the atmosphere, you have at the bottom the ocean, including an ice model, and this is Nemo and LIM. And uh, something uh, different from before is that now you have a wave model, and you also see that different uh, models are running sequentially one after the other. As I said, this model, uh, the wave and the ocean is, uh, are called as subroutines of the atmosphere. So um, basically, the uh, atmosphere tr uh, transfers uh, the surface velocities to the wave subroutine. The wave the stresses are calculated in the wave model, and then they are sent to the ocean model with uh, stoke drift and the, and the turbulent kinetic energy, which is associated to the breaking of waves. Um, and all this information is transferred to the uh, to the ocean. The atmosphere also um, uh, sends uh, the um, uh, the fluxes in this model are so calculated. The turbulent fluxes are also calculated in the atmosphere and sent to the ocean model. So the long wave, the short wave, uh, the latent heat, the sensible heat, and all the water fluxes. So this is, uh, again, as in the other example, the fluxes are calculated in the atmosphere, even if the atmosphere has usually a lower resolution. And the ocean transfers uh, back some uh, surface, very, uh, surface properties like the temperature over ocean and ice, the velocities and the ice fraction. So what is particular regarding this model is that it's uh, the different components are merged into one executable. The components are, are, are running uh, uh, sequentially, and you have a wave model. But you still you are you always have the problem of this flux calculation at the lowest resolution uh, in the uh, in the model which has the lowest resolution, which is not totally physically justified. So to um, to solve this problem, uh, Environment Canada proposes this coupling algorithm where what happens is that you have, uh, it's a coupling between here the atmosphere, the gem model, and the ocean ice model, NEMO plus LIM. So basically what happens is that the, uh, the ocean starts with some uh, value coming from the atmosphere, uh, some restart values, and uh, it runs its first uh, coupling period and it's the um and it's the uh the ocean and ice which uh, calculates uh the turbulent fluxes so this is the first example where the fluxes are calculated really at the resolution of the surface so the ocean um uh calculates uh the stresses the sensible heat the latent heat uh, and the stresses here and the ice fraction. And it sends those value, yeah, five minutes, that's fine, I'm almost done. Uh, and it sends those values to the atmosphere uh, 
uh, which runs its first and then its second uh, coupling period and then also its third coupling period with always the same values. And then uh, after the second uh, coupling period of the atmosphere, the uh, atmosphere sums sends uh, the variable, some uh, atmospheric variable at the first level, for example, the temperature or the velocities or the pressure. Uh, and it sends this to the uh, ocean, which can run its second uh, coupling period. So you will see, you see here that basically there is no asynchronicity uh, between the ocean and the atmosphere for the fields that are sent from the atmosphere to the ocean. It's really the fields calculated during the second period in the atmosphere that are used in the ocean at the second coupling period. But there's an asynchronicity of two coupling periods for the, the variable sense from the ocean to the atmosphere. You see here that the, the, the fields calculated by the ocean during the second period are used by the atmosphere in the fourth coupling period. So there's a, a, a synchronicity of two coupling periods. Uh, but uh, what is interesting here is that the, 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 flux, the, the surface and fluxes are calculated in the ocean at the resolution of the of the, the surface. And now uh, two minutes on the more complex algorithm implemented in CESM at NCAR and also in the Italian model. Basically, um, uh, I will not all go into all the details, but uh, what we have here, we have an atmosphere model running, uh, we have an ocean model, and we have separate uh, surface model, let's say for the, the land, the ice, and for the coupling. And what is uh, specific here about this model is that the, the turbulent diffusive flux, so the latent, the sensible, and the wind stress, they are calculating in all those uh, surface flux at the resolution of the surface. So this is, this is good physically. And they are uh, sent to the merge um, uh, module, which uh, merge the fluxes coming from these three uh, surface module and, and send that to the atmosphere, which uses them for uh, its coupling period. And then the atmosphere, um, uh, yeah, so, sorry, the turbulent fluxes are also sent to, to the ocean with an asynchronicity of one coupling period. Um, so, uh, yeah, regarding the short wave, the long wave, and the water fluxes, these are still calculated in the atmosphere, and they are sent to the different surface module, and they are also sent to the ocean via the act to ocean module. So, basically, here you see that um, that regarding the uh, the short wave and the long wave downward fluxes, there's an asynchronicity of two coupling period. The fluxes calculated at the at the the short wave, long wave, and water fluxes calculated in the atmosphere at one coupling period are sent to this module here, and then are sent to the ocean for the n plus two period. Well, for the n period here, so there's an asynchronicity of uh, two coupling period. So this is typically an example where the developers played with the lag of uh, the coupling fields to increase the performance of the simulation. This shift of two coupling period is physically tolerable as they involve the slowest ocean model, having more heat capacity and therefore more inertia. And uh, it allows the models to run concurrently and so to have a um, uh, an added level of parallelism and to increase the simulation throughput. So basically, uh, this was a little bit uh, fast, but you see that different choices are done in the different uh, uh, coupling, coupled uh, general circulation models, and some of them respect some physical uh, things that are physically important, other don't. Uh, there's a, they play on the lags of the different coupling fields, so to ensure the, the, the concurrency of the different models, so to get some parallelism. 
So I'm uh, done. So one minute just uh, for a summary. So as I showed, uh, playing with the lags of the different coupling fields, one can implement sequential or concurrent coupling between uh, two components. And you've seen also um, examples where uh, the algorithm implemented was sometimes a mix of those two a basic type of coupling. Um, we've seen the advantages and disadvantages of those uh, type of um, uh, way of uh, implementing the coupling in terms of performance. Uh, we've gone over some coupling software used in climate modeling, so ESMF, CPS7, CPS7 and FMS, which represented the, the first uh, category of coupling software that I call the integrated coupling framework approach. And then I've also uh, described OASIS, which is uh, the example I shown uh, about the, the coupler or the coupling library approach. Uh, as I said, we, we can split the different coupling software in those two main uh, categories. And uh, and you've uh, seen different coupling algorithms uh, implemented in some uh, some coupled general circulation models, which are always compromises between uh, physical consistency and performance, and also historical developments. So I'm done, and I think it's about the right time. Okay, great, Sophie. That was a really, really good talk. Really interesting. Uh, so thank you very, thank you very much for that. Uh, do we have any questions for Sophie? We've got time for a couple of questions. You can also, uh, I mean, go back to the presentation and ask question later if you if you have some, and I will be happy to answer those. Okay, so well, let, let's. Uh, oh, we have a question. Okay, from uh, from T Row. How do coupling algorithms generally handle coastal grid points, especially if the ocean and atmosphere land models have different resolutions? How do you then go about choosing whether the outputs on a particular grid point can be considered either land or ocean? That's a very uh, good question. That's a very specific problem about ocean and atmosphere coupling. Uh, the right way to uh, solve this problem is to uh, you take your ocean grid, you take the uh, the sea land mask as defined by your ocean, and you suppose that this is the truth, and you uh, you regrid your ocean uh, land mask on the atmosphere grid. And this should uh, define the proportion of water and land that you should consider in your atmosphere model. So that's the only proper way of solving this problem is to adapt the proportion of water and uh, land in your atmosphere model depending on uh, on the sea land mask of your ocean. And if you do this, you will have a coherent system, a well paused problem, and uh, you will uh, be able to do a perfectly conservative uh, coupling. If you don't do that, that is, if there's a mismatch between the land, uh, between the, the, land, the, the sea land mask in the atmosphere and the ocean, or between the, the, the proportion of water in each cell uh, in your atmosphere and what your ocean wants would like to see, uh, then you have to make choices. Uh, but it's a basically ill pause problem and uh, you will have to choose between doing something either locally conservative, but that will give you funny and crazy values sometimes, or non-locally conservative uh, uh, things uh, that will make your model run, but that will, I mean, you will use the, 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 the global conservation. So this is a very delicate problem. And um, yeah, very good question. And yeah, there's a good way to do this, but it's not possible to do in all models. It supposes that your atmosphere can consider different subsurfaces. Can you get a link? Link to what? 
the ah, presentation presentation slide okay great yeah but they but they will come up on the web pages so um okay yeah, for the the web pages for the um the school the school itself so they 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 will someone can post that that would be great so thank you again to sophie for a great great talk about coupling there's a lot of information in there really well presented thank you i learned a lot um